Thanks, Vance. I, I, the check's in the mail, Vance. Everything that, everything that you said, thank you. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, I don't know what I deserve, but I know I've been working for a long time in this industry. But for me, I'm honored to be able to share the stage with the winner of an Oscar, eh, BAFTA, two Critics' Choice Awards, three SAG Awards, Best Actress at Venice, Best Actress at Cannes twice, only four Emmys, a Tony, and a title from the Queen. Her HBO four-part series, Captain the Great, is on now. And next week, her film, The Good Liar, opens. Uh, and I could, like, Vance, I could go on and on, but uh, I'm sure you'd rather hear from us. So please let me introduce Dame Helen Mirren. Thank you, Hawk. Hi, everyone. Hey. So we're both thrilled to be here. We are, absolutely. And you're in for, for, for quite an evening, I have to say, I, I think, because you have, uh, as Vance just introduced Hawk, um, a man of such in de a depth of experience, um, knowledge, um, excitement, um, commitment to the film industry. Um, I met Hawk. Uh, quite early on, he, he did a film with my husband, one of my husband's, in fact, my husband's first major film, um, Hawk, produced. When I met Hawk, he was still called Howard, and that's a story. Um, and as Vance said, um, I really advise you to read Hawk's book. Um, it's only just uh, been published, but it is the most wonderful um, uh, journey through filmmaking. It, it teaches you a huge amount about about the requirements of filmmaking. Um, it's very personal. It's it's very sweet, and and Hawke really um, communicates his, you know, his life's history with us. I, I'm I'm sure many of you know that his father was a very very major um, producer in Hollywood called Howard Koch. I guess. A senior when you came along, you were yes. Howard Koch Jr. Yes. Um, but you know, I incredibly influential and and very beloved producer in in Hollywood. Um, and this this book is just a, a wonderful story of that relationship, of his relationship with film. It is packed with the most delicious um, Hollywood stories. I mean, s funny and educative and and gossipy and interesting. And um, and I'm sure we're going to hear some of those tonight. I hope. Uh, <laughs> yes. I hope so. I yes. hope so. And uh, and and the book is called Magic Time. And I love that title. I absolutely, I found it very inspiring. And Hawk, I, I want you to, to tell us how you came upon that title. Uh, well, uh, we went through lots of titles, trying to figure out what it should be. But uh, when I was four years old, as Helen said, my father was, uh, was in the business, and he was an assistant director. And uh, I was very shy. I don't know how that changed, but uh, I used to hide behind my mother's dress. And at four years old, my father was making a movie in Colorado. And uh, my mother drove my older sister and I up there. And the next day, I didn't want to go to the set. I didn't even know what the set was, but I was dragged into the car with my father. We drove a little while. And then I saw cowboys and Indians. And I saw teepees and horses and cavalry. There was a catering truck and some trucks off to the side, but <laughs> it didn't matter. And I. I I was walking around around the teepees, and a Native American said, come sit on my lap. And I sat on his lap, and many moons. It was Ricardo Montalban. It wasn't <laughs> in those days, you know. And, and then somebody said, have you ever been on a horse before? No. And somebody picked me up and put me in front of this big man. And I rode around for like, I don't know, five minutes probably. But it was the greatest thing. This man held me, and I, I remember riding through the, the fields there. And when I got home that night, I was known as Little Howie because my father was Big Howie. And my father said to my mother, guess who gave Little Howie his first horseback ride? And my mother said, who? And my father said, Clark Gable. And that's a true story. <laughs> so I've been in the business my whole life. And uh, being on a movie set, because I never got to see my dad, because in those days they worked six, sometimes seven days a week. The only time I saw my dad was on a set. So I fell in love with the set. I worked with the grips, the electricians, wardrobe, 
uh, sound, you name it, every, every time I did. And being on a set to me was magical. Then going to a movie theater and seeing the Ten Commandments up on a big screen, oh my God. And still today, I'm one of those people who don't want to watch movies on television. I want to watch them in a theater. <clears throat> I, I absolutely agree. There's nothing like that moment when the lights go down, you know, um, and you have a couple of ads, but you're waiting for the, the big event. Exactly. It's a great, great moment. With your po I can't ha go in without popcorn. So that's number two is magical. And number three, I was fortunate enough in the 1960s to work with Jack Lemmon. Everybody know who Jack Lemmon is. <clears throat> in 1962, he made a film called The Days of Wine and Roses in which he was, he played an alcoholic. And before he had a drink, he'd go, magic time. And then he'd take a drink. Well, by the time I worked with him in 1967 on a movie called The Odd Couple, um, yeah, that was amazing. Um, if Helen and I were, t if I was Jack and Helen and I were talking in the AD yelled role, he would go magic time. And he would, as an actor, you'll know this, he absolutely got into character, totally focused. And he'd do it at every single time that we were doing a scene. So I absconded with that, and quietly behind the video, or wherever I was working, I would say magic time to myself, because then I could focus the same way that Jack had taught me. And a few times, I, uh, I actually had to talk in front of a large audience, and before I talked, uh, and I was introduced like in front of 1.3 billion people at the Oscars. Oh my God! Um, well, you know, because you've gone up and won an Oscar. I don't know how you did, how you got up there and talked, but I said magic time before. So those are the three things why it's called magic time. So yes, and I'm going to take that. I I I, I said to you after I read I read your book Hawk that I just love that that sort of mantra of here we go. Here we go into the world of imagination. Right. Here we go into telling stories. It's magic time. Oh. I, I absolutely love that. It's very interesting you said video, because of course, I'm sure when you first started making films, as when I did, no video, no, no, no way to check whether the, whether the shot was you know, in focus or right. if the camera move was correct exactly. or the acting was okay. Yeah. Um, you you, had, you had to wait right. for the you know, So for the talking dailies. about your magic, tell me, <laughs> at five years old, you were transported by the magic of theater. Tell me what your trajectory was to acting and how it began. Oh, gosh, Hawk, that's a long story. <laughs> but um, n no, I, um, well, I'm going to jump, if you don't mind, I'll jump over the sort of beginning of it all. I, I mean, um, I came into the world of drama through watching um, a Shakespeare play, actually. It was an amateur production of Hamlet, which I saw when I was about... No, the first thing I saw actually was a show at the end of the pier. I grew up in, in the British equivalent of Coney Island. Very different from your background. <laughs> and I, I didn't know anybody in the film industry or in the theatre world or anything at all. It was a, you know, when you're outside of it, you haven't really ever experienced that because you're always in the castle. When you're outside of the castle, you're, you're pe the peasant at the gates, you know, uh, it's, it, it seems impenetrable. It's how do you get in there? You know, it seems like an impossible place to ever, ever get into. Um, but anyway, so I grew up on the yeah, British equivalent of, of Coney Island. And, um, and they ha we had a, a pier, the longest pier in the world, longer than anyone in America, um, a mile and a quarter long. And at the end of the pier, um, they would do an end of the pier show. And when I was about five or six, my parents took me to that show and the lights went down in the auditorium and the lights went up on the stage, and onto the stage came, it was a variety show, it wasn't acting, it was comedians and singing and dancing, you know, girls and stuff, and I was just absolutely transported. It was that moment of, like you seeing the cowboys, it's like that absolutely magical moment when you, you, you just you, you just can't believe that anything so beautiful and, and fascinating as this exists. And then fast forward to Hamlet, and I saw a Shakespearean production of Hamlet, and that's when I realized that, then that's when I began to understand the telling of stories, the entering into the world of imagination, poetry, um, character. 
uh, and all of those things. Uh, and that was sort of what, what led me into wanting to become an actress. Whether I was going to be able to or not was a whole other story. But honestly, before we go much further down our trajectories, I want to introduce Hawke's work to you on the, f on, on the screen so you have a deep and more profound understanding of his unbelievable achievement I that's brought him to this, p this, plane si pl this place in his life. So have a, have a look at this. Be impressed. And that's just a fraction of his life's work. I mean, what an incredible parade of movies, of actors, of characters that, that, that Hawke has been intimately involved with. Um, it, it, it's an, ex an extraordinarily impressive um, uh, life. Thank so you. Far. Can we talk about you now? Because it's <laughs> getting a little bit. <laughs> no, this is a, one, one more thing, Hawke. Okay. Just one okay. more question. Okay. Uh, and that is um, y your name, Hawk. We hear you being called Howard in yes. in that package there. Um, and as I said earlier on, when I first met you, you were Howard. Um, I was uh, I was present at the, the wonderful moment that you yes. changed your changed your um, name. Yes. But tell us tell us about that. Well, <coughs> as Vance started to talk, and you said I had I had a man. My father was the most well loved man in Hollywood. How do I know that? Because not every month or every week, but every day of my life as I was growing up, any time I was introduced to someone as Howard Koch Jr., um, <coughs> it was, uh, it was, oh, I know your dad. He's such a wonderful man. Jeez, you, uh, you must be so proud of him. And geez, he did this for me, or he did that for my cousin or my sister or whatever. Please say hi to him for me. But they never talked to me. And so I was, just there as a mirror for, for them to talk about my dad. And I never really thought about that. And in, uh, in 1951 or 52, my dad was an assistant director at MGM making a little bit of money. <coughs> and the phone rang, and I apologize because I'm going to say a couple of bad words in a minute. Um, uh, the phone rang, and I was like five or six, and my parents weren't home, and I answered the phone, and I said, Koch residence, and somebody said, is your father there? And I said, yes, may I take a message? Yeah, you can tell him he's a motherfucking cocksucking communist pig. <laughs> wow, and hung up the phone. And I didn't know any of those words. <laughs> and when my father came home, as any good five or six-year-old would do, I verbatim, <laughs> repeated the story and that night because my because there was a second Howard Koch not my father the other Howard Koch was a uh, an Academy Award winning writer who had written Casablanca along with Julius Epstein uh, and he is also he had also worked with uh, with Orson Welles uh, he was a pretty famous uh, writer but my dad was afraid he was gonna lose his job at MGM so he changed his name to add the W Howard W. Koch. And so he ingrained in me that I was never Howard Koch Jr., I was Howard W. Koch Jr. And for those of you who put your initials on school books, I didn't put HK, I put HWK. That's the way I had to do it. And a few people called me Hawk, but it never really stuck. So uh, I went through a few marriages and a few relationships in my life. And many films. And many films. <laughs> and. Uh, at 49 years old, a relationship I was in had just broken up, and I was in a lot of pain. And a good Catholic buddy of mine, Gary Lucchese, who used to be president of the PGA, and I were having lunch, and he, he said, what's wrong? And I said, I'm just in so much pain. He, he said, what are you going to do for your 50th birthday? And I said, I'd love to do something spiritual. He said, well, I've been to all your children's bar and bat mitzvahs. Can you get bar mitzvahed at 50? And I perked up, and I said, Gary, I don't know. Wow, what a great idea. It gave me something to do instead of be in, in the dumps. So I contacted a, a rabbi who taught Kabbalah and Hebrew meditation, and I went to his office, and he was a wonderful man, and for the first half hour I talked to him. Uh, it was great, and then he said to me, well, who are you? And very quickly I went, oh, I'm a movie producer. And he said, no, 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 who are you? And I said, oh, uh, uh, I'm a father and I'm a son, 
And I thought, you know, now I've told him. And he said, who are you? And I didn't know. And something inside me just said, oh, I'm a Jewish man. And he said to me, that's a start. And I said, okay, great. He said, what's your Hebrew name? And I said, oh, my parents were non-religious, so I never had a Hebrew name. You, you hadn't had a bar mitzvah before then? Never had a bar mitzvah. And he said to me, well, for your bar mitzvah, for your 50th birthday, you'll be given your own name. Well, when he said that, I broke down. And he said, what's wrong? And I said, well, I just realized for 49 years I've had my father's name. And I want my own name. And then he said the, the words that changed my life. A rabbi said to me, you can have your own name. What? I could have my own name. And we talked about you want to be called Frank or Jerry or Taylor. <laughs> Taylor was out. <laughs> Wherever he's sitting. Um, and, uh, and he said, did you ever have a nickname? And I said, well, my initials were HWK. And a few people called me Hawk, but it didn't stick. And he said, do you know anything about Hawks? And I said, a bird of prey. And he said, no, well, no, hawks mate for life. And I said, well, that's something I was not very good at. <laughs> he said, they also can see from horizon to horizon, and they can see like a rabbit a half a mile away. Wouldn't it be great if you could see the panoramic of your life and the detail always at the same time? And I thought, wow, this guy, he's got me. I'm in trouble with this guy. And uh, I decided to go away, and I went to Colorado for a week to really think about, at 49 years old, having run a production company, produced movies, done a lot of stuff, could I actually change my name? And while up there, I saw a Native American, and he was, you can't really see this, but he was selling trinkets, and in this trinket has a cloud, a lightning bolt, and the word listen. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, do you know the way we all are awake and aware and attuned between the lightning and the thunder? We see it, we hear it, we taste it, we feel it. He said, wouldn't it be great if you could be that awake and aware all the time, not just between the lightning and the thunder? And I thought that was a sign that, oh, there's the A, H-W-K with the A for Hawk. So I came home, I got bar mitzvahed in front of Helen, I was and, there, and, absolutely, with my, Taylor, with my husband. Yeah, and it was Taylor was there. Most beautiful, beautiful um, experience. And it was, it was very, very lovely. And then when I started to meet people, and uh, what's your name? Oh, hi, I'm Hawk Koch. They didn't say, oh, I know your dad. They actually talked to me. They said, what a weird name. Or how'd you get that name? Or, you know, what is it about? And so they talked to me as opposed to about my dad. So. It really changed my life, and uh, I'm really, I'm really proud. And I feel, I feel like I strive every day to try and see both the panoramic and the detail of my life. It's such a beautiful story, Hawk. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful and very moving story, and and um, and I love the way that you share it. I love the way you share it in the book, um, and and as you just shared it with all of us right here. And and I find that the the not the contradiction, but but the fact that you were an incredibly successful producer. You'd done all of this amazing work in a very powerful and uh, proactive role, you know. Um, and later on, hopefully, we'll talk about the role of producer and exactly what that is. People get very confused about what is a producer, don't they? Um, but um, you'd done all that extraordinary work, so you had every reason to hold your head up and, and, and pat yourself on the back and say, I did that. But all, all along, there was this, just this one little, whatever it was. Yeah, well, it's just, uh, you know, I, I remember. Fault line, as yeah. in a fault line, that, y you know, you, you just had to. My father was, uh, was president of the Academy in the 1970s. He produced eight Oscar shows. And I was doing very well. I was producing movies, running everything, and I went to backstage in pre-production of one of the Oscar shows, and I was introduced as Howard Koch Jr., and they said, oh, I love your dad. They did the whole thing, and then they said, are you in the business? And that would always just 
yes. grab you yes, down. Yes, of course. So getting out from under that shadow yes. is really the spine of the book. But I have to say something, Helen, because you are you are so generous. I mean, this is the most generous lady. We're here to talk about both of us. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, we, 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 we got plenty of time. We got plenty of time. <laughs> but the other thing I, 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 I want to say, Hawk, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But um, but I, as, as we see in your book, you know, you the, the the hard work that you put into it i was so impressed by it because so many young scions of hollywood the way you absolutely were the princelings you know the sons and daughters of the famous famous incredibly successful hollywood producers or actors or directors you know what y y you didn't turn your back on that but you just absolutely went in on the ground level on the you know uh, of of, um, I hard. started as a PA. You started as a PA, yeah. really, just the yeah. basic hard work, right. and, and uh, you know, and and I could tell, you, it was so clear why you became the successful producer well. that you became because you were prepared to do the absolute. Yeah, I still. Work. If somebody says, you know, <laughs> do we need somebody to push a dolly or or, you know, turn on a light? I'm still. I mean, we're, as I want to talk to you about this, but making a movie is a family. There is no strata. Mm. If there is, those are the wrong people. I don't want to work with them. We are all together. Actors, writers, directors, producers, craft service. <laughs> and so you talked about, you, you talked about what, what happened on, uh, on, on your television show, Prime Suspect, yes. and how mm. something happened where you talked about being part of that family. Can you kind of talk about that? Yes, of course. I mean, w when you do a TV series, I, have you ever done a TV series, no. Hawk? No. If somebody wants to hire me. <laughs> <I'll>. <laughs> uh, um, you know, it's a much. It's like making a movie, only it go goes on for years. You know, <laughs> at least you're with the family for a long, a much longer time. So yes, I, I certainly learnt um, that you are all in it together. Absolutely, very, very important part of the process. And I would say if I learned how to perform on film, um, I, I learned with Prime Suspect. I had done films before then. Um, in fact, I'd done the film with my husband. Right. But I always right. felt right. on a film set that I just, I call it r r um, rabbit in the headlights acting a little bit, or deer in the headlights. It's like turnover action. <gasps> oh, I don't know what to do. Um, so um, I, I was never very satisfied with my with my performances, I still am not if that's a word, I'm still not. But, um, you know, uh, but I've learned an awful lot more. And I learned, I learned about technique on with Prime Suspect. Well, yeah. Why don't we take a look at some of the things that Helen's performed, uh, and it'll blow you away. Why don't we <laughs> run the film? Okay. So you were talking about acting and how you sometimes deer in the headlights. Something happened when you were working with Peter Weir on Mosquito Coast that you mentioned. What did you mean that you were able to free yourself? Oh, poor Peter. I have to say, it, 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 you know, I was just, I must have been so irritating. I, f I feel sorry for a lot of the directors I've worked with because... <laughs> I mean, because of my ignorance and, and, and my inabilities. I mean, John Borman, when we did Excalibur, um, uh, and, and your description of, of walking on the set and the cowboys and the, m the magic of that. And with me, it was walking on the set of, of um, Excalibur and there is Camelot and there are, you know, knights in armor and flags and, and the, just the m transportational magic of that has, has never left me. I've always loved that. But uh, as with John Borman and, and Peter Weir, I, w I was just, I was so technically inept. I didn't know what I was doing. And, and so I thought with, with Mosquito Coast, I would kind of use it um, to find freedom on turnover action, um, just to find a, a freedom. I, I, I wanted to make myself unaware of the camera, with the result, of course, that I was always wandering out of shot. <laughs> <laughs> poor poor Pete, uh, Peter was driven crazy. Well, Helen, where are you? Where do you want her off to? I said, well, I'm being free. <laughs> but it's, it's incredible working with the great, 
uh, the great American film actors, and I've had the great privilege of working with P Pacino, for example, and watching people like De Niro work, he worked with my husband, uh, the great, great um, American film actors. They are utterly technical, utterly technical, on their mark, you know, no, they know the size of the lens, they know what part of their body is in shot, what part isn't in shot, um, and they play that like a Stradivarius beautifully, but within that incredible technique, they are utterly free. And, um, you know, I still watch that with wonder, and I'm still clawing my way sort of towards that and trying to be inspired by it and yeah, learn she's from really it. tried hard and <laughs> i'm <laughs> well, sorry I, you but know. one of the great actresses <laughs> ever now so, i want uh, to ask now you ask me a question <laughs> <laughs> i'm allowed to ask you a question we saw those amazing actors you've worked with those incredible personalities big personalities, I'm sure, a lot of them, and not ne necessarily terribly easy. And you worked with the great Natalie Wood. Is that, is that correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, for, for a 19-year-old boy who had seen Splinter in the Grass, West oh, Side wow. Story, Gypsy, uh, Love with a Proper Stranger, I, along with probably every other 19-year-old boy, was in love with Natalie Wood. And on the third day of shooting, we're down in a place called Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, on this movie. It was called This Property is Condemned. It was a Tennessee Williams short story. Yes. It starred uh, Natalie Wood, a young actor named Robert Redford, who was in his wow, second film, really and, and directed by Sidney Pollack, who went on Out of Africa, Tootsie, you name it. Uh, they shoot horses. I mean, he was an amazing director. And I was for a lot of reasons, I became the second AD by day one at 10 o'clock in the morning. And on day three, uh, I, I was told, go get Natalie Wood from her trailer. So I didn't walk, I ran <laughs> from the set, I ran to base camp. As all good PAs all good, will, yeah, right. <laughs> they run. And yeah. I knocked on the door and I said, uh, and she said, yes. And I said, we're ready for you. And I was waiting for her to open the door, and she didn't open the door, and she said, oh, I'll be out in a few minutes. And as any st stupid 19-year-old would do, I said, oh, well, James Wong Howe, two Oscars as a cinematographer, James Wong Howe said, the light is perfect. She opened the door, she came down, she took my arm, and we walked up to the set. When she went in front of the camera, Everybody came over to me and said, how did you get Natalie Wood out of her trailer? She never comes out of her trailer. <laughs> and I said, well, I told her the light was perfect. I've used that with every actor for the last. <laughs> <laughs> but at, at, that, at that moment, at that time, I had been working a couple of weeks to talk about having to work hard. I had been working a couple of weeks on the movie and I was in the bathroom and two of the crew walked into the bathroom, didn't see me. And one said to the other, you know, the only reason that that guy, Howard Koch Jr., got, uh, got the job is because his dad's head of Paramount. This wasn't a Paramount picture, but my dad had helped me get this job. And uh, my heart sank. What? I only got this job because of my father and how am I ever going to? The other guy, thank God, said, yeah, he probably did get the job because of his father, but give him a break because he's doing a really good job and he's working harder than anybody else. Yeah. So for all of you out there, um, when people always ask me, well, how do you know, you know when there's six PAs line up in front of you on day one of shooting a movie, how do you know who's going to make it and who doesn't? You know. It's interesting. I, I, it's, you, there could be somebody having to stop traffic two blocks down from where you're shooting, and that's their job. And if I happen to walk down because I'm going to the catering truck or something else, and the guy's on a phone and he's eating a sandwich and everything, and the other guy is there timing, timing the traffic light and figuring out and wanting to know how they're doing up there and how close, who do you think I think is a better mm -hmm. PA? Mm -hmm. And that person is gonna make it, and the other one is never gonna make it, and then he goes, well, wh why don't you want to work with me? Why? Because they're not paying attention. When you're working on a set, it is, yeah, it's hurry up and wait, but the waiting period, there's a lot of thought going on in that waiting period. It's not just, oh, I'll just wait till, 
until everything happens. I absolutely couldn't agree more. I mean, it's very clear uh, um, which PAs are going to make it uh, and which ones aren't. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's an incredibly badly paid job, and you're there f early, early in the morning, and you're very often the last one of the last to leave at night. Um, but it's those ones who run <laughs> yes. to the trailer. Exactly. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's weird. It's very clear which ones are going to make it in. And also you can tell they've got the light of excitement in their eyes. They've got the magic time look in their eyes of, oh, my God, this is so cool. This is fantastic. And the fact that it's cold and wet and rainy and you're out there for 13, 14 hours, they don't have nice warm trailers to go and sit in or, you know, anything like, or people to get nice hot coffees. Uh, uh, and the good ones are, are just absolutely wonderful. And that goes from not just the PAs, but everybody all the way up the line. Yes. If the, you, We all know who's, who's doing the work and who, do, who isn't. Yes. And also mm. you... Kind it's of sort of like members of a tribe in a way, isn't yeah, it? You yeah. you sort of say, oh yes, yeah, sh she's a member of the tribe. Exactly. What h what breaks my heart now, um, Hawk, and I don't know if the Producers Guild are doing anything about this, but certainly the case in, in Britain, is that financially it's so hard for young, um, and I'm talking about producers, but the same thing goes into act that acting world, it's so hard financially for, for kids from a working, for want of a better word, a working class background, a, a financially challenged background. It's so hard for them to um, enter into the film industry, especially on that level, because the pay is terrible. They, often they're doing it for free. Runners are doing it for free. Um, they need a car to get to the set. So it... It, um, you know, they need financial support, and I, I don't know if the producers' guild are doing anything uh, ab about that. Vance, <laughs> Vance, Susan, I, th I, th I know that we are doing a lot of diversity work. Yeah, we're helping young people as much as we can. The academy is doing the same kind of thing, where we have interns. Uh, at the academy where it's called Academy Gold, and we're teaching and working with, and. Those kids at both the Producers Guild and the Academy, like anything else, you see where the talent is and where the energy is, yeah. you know? So I want to ask you a question now yeah. because I'm okay. always curious and there's an awful lot of actors out here. You've done a great deal of theater, television, and film. Can you describe the differences between those three dif those disciplines and do you do things differently for each? Well, the first thing to understand is that you always want to be doing the one that you're not doing. Because <laughs> <it's all laughs> because the grass is always greener, you know. And obviously the huge difference is, is the schedule. On, uh, in a movie, you're getting up at five in the morning and going to work at six. And on a f on in the theatre, you're you're going to bed at five in the morning, <laughs> you know, um, and getting up at eleven or twelve, you know, because you it's impossible to go to bed after after doing a show. Right. You just have to sort of you, you you need two or three. You never get to bed before three in the morning if you're doing a show. So the whole schedule is completely different. Um, uh, front in front of the camera, of course, you are essentially doing the same thing. You are imaginatively putting yourself into a, into a s telling a story. But having said that, it is absolutely so different. You know, on uh, in the theater, you are your own editor. You know, you are in your your own director, editor. Uh, that obviously you have a uh, you know wonderful director who's got you to that point. But then come first night you don't see the director again now now it's yours and so you, so you are in charge of 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 what happens between you and the audience in on a film obviously that happens basically in the editing room um and uh and also the actual um moment of performance it's it's weird it's it's i would say it's more intense on film it's more nerve-wracking um, because you have to, you know, y y ov obviously if you do it wrong, it lands on the editing room, so uh, editing room floor. So, you y you know, you've got a bit of, uh, you've got some leeway let me ask there. You, let me ask a question. I've always been curious about this. When you're shooting a master, is your performance changed when all of a sudden you're in a big close-up? Oh, absolutely. Okay. 
Oh okay. yes, of course. Yes. Right. Totally. Okay. Uh, so I, and I think I think also as a theatre actor, you're very aware of um, of uh, of the the story that your whole body is telling. So you know what you're doing with your hands in a master shot, or what what you're doing with your feet, or you know it can tell us it can help tell the story. So I think theatre actors are very aware of that. Um, on the other hand, if it's this or this. No, you're telling the story in a very, very different way. You've got di very different tools. Right. I um, remember working with a stage actress many, many years ago who knew how to emote on the stage, and this was her first movie. And she was emoting to the point where the director kept saying, pull, come, pull, pull it back. back. Pull him back. We're yes. here. Yes. You don't have to. No, no. And it was true. very difficult for her. Yes, yeah. I, I, I think. You ha when you have to, you've just done a, a play and now you're going to do a movie. You, obviously, you have the experience now, but was there ever a time where you, oh, God. I don't think so, no. I, I think that um, apart from that sort of slight deer in the headlights acting, as I said, um, I don't think I ever had that problem. I'm, uh, mind you, I think a lot of actors mistakenly think that film acting is sort of doing nothing. And the absolute opposite is true. That film acting is doing everything, but doing it very minimally, very tight, very um, reduced, or whatever the word is. You could do so much with just a look. Um, the, the slightest movement of, of your mouth or w whatever. And, and also, you mustn't be self-conscious about that. That's the other important thing, I think. I never want wanted to watch rushes when we had rushes. I never go to the video to watch. I, d I don't want to be self-conscious. Um, Excuse me, but you just found... Th there was a diamond, not a pearl, a diamond bit of wisdom <laughs> from one of the greatest <laughs> actresses of all time <laughs> yeah. for all of you actors out yeah. there. That's okay, amazing. Well, thank, thank you, you Ellen. Um, but conversely, a lot of uh, film actors can't act on stage. Yeah. And they're, you know, they're wonderful on the screen. Put them on the stage, there's nothing there. They're just like, they're like an empty hole there, you know. <laughs> uh, um, so, you know, it, it, it works both ways, so to speak, you know. Right. Yeah. Is there, what do you consider your favorite performance of everything you've done? Oh, God, that... What's your favorite film? <laughs> you can't answer that, can you? They're all about our ten. <laughs> <laughs> they're all our babies, aren't they? We, yes. They, we, you can't. Well, that's a good answer. You can't choose between them. I mean, um, the most sort of surprising ones sometimes are your favorite. I have to say a film, I, I, and my husband is here, and I'm not saying it because he's here, but uh, the first film I did with him, White Nights, which you saw a little bit of tonight, um, was wonderful. But we did a film together called Love Ranch. Um, which took place in a, uh, in a brothel in Nevada. And, um, and it wasn't successful. But I still, that's the one movie that I kind of would like to have another go out there because I, I, think, it was, I think it was fantastic. In it, uh, and um, I, don't, I don't think it was treated properly, you know. Yeah. Well, have you got any of those oh that you yeah, don't feel I, were treated properly? Oh, yeah. I, I, th there's two that I can think of. One was called The Long Walk Home yes. with Sissy Spacek and Whoopi Goldberg. And it was, it was a tough movie. It was about the beginning of the Montgomery bus bo boycott. And didn't and Taylor, Taylor, that was one of Taylor's, Taylor's, Taylor's company. films. Com uh, yes. Yeah, Taylor's company. You think did I didn't know? Yes. I, <laughs> I want to give Taylor <laughs> yeah, as much right. yes. credit as possible. Yes, we're going to get it, tra Taylor, very soon. That was a great soon. movie. And yeah. It was, it was probably before its time. It was before its time, and yeah. I think today it would be, it, it probably would get garner a lot of awards. Absolutely. Uh, it was released by the Weinstein Company, yes. uh, Miramax, mm. yeah. and I think it was a few years before they figured out how to push everything out, but I think Sissy and Whoopi and a lot of things on that movie would have been nominated. Mm. And the other one was a movie called Losing Isaiah, with Halle Berry and Jessica Lange. Yes. And mm -hmm. I loved making that movie. I loved what it was about. And I remember standing in the back of, of a preview with Sherry Lansing, who was the head of Paramount at the time, and Sherry just saying, I'm so proud that we made this movie. But it was not successful at all. But be, I think because it was such a hard piece of material, it was about a, a, a young crack addict who has abandons her baby at two days old in a, in a dumpster. The baby is found, taken to a hospital where Jessica Lang's a, a nurse, 
and she ad basically adopts the baby and takes the baby home. And four years later, the, uh, the mother, Halle Berry, has cleaned up her life and finds where Isaiah is and wants the baby back. I think it was too tough for that particular time, and it probably would have played great on HBO or one of these other, other places today. But, so those are two that I really just felt, somebody asked me, you know, how do you decide on what movie you want to do? I think it's, 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 you know, they're called moving pictures. I heard this today, and it was David Brown of Zanuck Brown, great, great producer, who said they're called moving pictures. So if something moves me, that's what the movie I want to make. <laughs> that's right. That's great. So, yes. Do you want to go? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Is there a character that you'd love to play that you've, you've watched and you go, oh, boy, I wish I could do that? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, in terms of other other people's performances, yeah. I, I, or, or I often, that, or one that there's so often out. watch um, uh, other performances. But I'm saying on. there's a lot of producers out there. If you talk about a character you might want to play, they well, might hit you with a screenplay uh, very the, soon. The trouble is, Hawk, this, I was caught by this quite recently. Uh, I was asked that very question. Um, usually it's towards the end of an interview for an actor that they ask you, you know, right. what are you doing next or right. what would you like to do? Right. And I could, I could never think of it, anything. My mind goes blank at a moment like that. Mm -hmm. But sort of I'd been reading about Catherine the Great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, to, you know, ra very randomly and absolutely without question, this was never going to happen. So I was safe saying it. Well, I'd quite like to play Catherine the Great sometime. <laughs> so uh, a producer got busy and went out and, and raised the uh, raised the finance by two wonderful producers, Charlie Patterson and David Thompson. And they came, they said, guess what? We've got the money to make Catherine the Great. <laughs> and uh, you're going to be executive producer. Now we just have to find the writer and the director. Oh, my God. I mean, I was terrified. I was just, uh, my heart fell, actually. <laughs> well, <laughs> But now I'm, I'm and And so producers, proud. Andy Harris, who you had and worked Andy, with. Andy, who I'd worked with before. Tell absolutely. me how that, how the queen happened. Well, that's also a producer, a, a very much a producer's story. Um, he was one of the producers on um, Prime Suspect. Right. And I was doing what turn, what was basically the last Prime, Prime Suspect. And um, whenever I did that show, um, we w if we could, we'd have a read-through of the script um, before we started shooting. And it, whenever we had a read-through, I'd make sure that I got to the uh, rehearsal room first before all the other actors came in, so I could greet them and make them feel at ease and, you know, just sort of, you know, just make oh, yeah. sure that Every they Every actor does that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I felt it was important because it can be intimidating when you're walking into a, you know, some with a whole lot of people you've never worked with before, and it's a job and it's frightening. So um, I would make sure that I'd, you know, welcome them and say, don't worry, we're all in this together sort of thing. Um, Anyway, I was down the end doing this, and Andy was up at the other end, and he saw this process going on, and uh, he said, oh, my God, they're treating her like the queen. <laughs> and then he thought, she looks a bit like the queen as well. <laughs> and then, and in that, at that moment, was born in Andy's mind the idea of doing the queen, the wow. movie. So he then went to um, uh, Peter Morgan, who, uh, who wrote The Crown, uh, but also wrote the film of the Queen. He'd done a wonderful piece about Tony Blair and Gordon Brown before this, and he he asked Peter if he would write it, uh, and me if I would be in it. Um, but yes, it was co completely came from a a, produ a great producer's um, inspiration. Talk, talk about to me, prep is everything. Yes, yeah. I read. I got that from your book. How yeah. intensely you prep. Well, it, I thought that was fascinating. Well, you have to, and I was going to ask. Well, uh, okay. yes, you have to. <laughs> okay. No, uh, I'm, I don't yeah. mean you have to as a right. producer. I mean you do. And, and I think that's what makes you uh, such an extraordinary and successful and, and, and producer that everybody wants to work with because of the depth of the prep that you do. Oh. Um, and, and what an incredible gift that must be to a director, to have a producer who is capable of doing that, let alone one that actually does it. But as an actor, I, I'm, I'm lazy. <laughs> I don't prep very much, honestly. Shh. 
Shh, I don't, don't tell anyone. Um, I mean, I but do. You must have read a lot about Catherine the Great. Yes, before of course you, I yes. did. Okay, I, right. I, of course I did. I, uh, especially if you're playing a real character, right. you absolutely must do right. a certain amount of. Uh, and what happened right. when you met the Queen after doing <laughs> the Queen? Um, that's a whole other story. <laughs> but uh, yes, how well, it turned the she invited over me. To her <laughs> She invited me for tea at uh, at Ascot. Wow. Yes. Just the two of you? No, the I, I mean, uh, I, it w I I thought it was going to be in a room with two hundred other people, <laughs> which is often, you know, not often. I've I've met her once before, and it was in a room with two hundred other people. Um, so I said, oh well, I can manage that. So it was at Ascot, you know, the horsey place, which I hardly ever go to, but for once, <laughs> once. Well, but Taylor likes the horses. That <laughs> I know. Yeah, he loves the horses. It's true. Um, and I got message came to me that the, the Queen would like to invite you to tea. She knows you're here. So, um, I, oh, lovely, thank you. Well, I walk in, and there's like te eight people sitting around a table. Um, Prince Philip, the Queen, a sheikh of somewhere or other, <laughs> uh, you know, and a couple of horsey people. Well, I know... <laughs> I know absolutely nothing about horses at all. So, you know, and the Queen knows everything about horses. And I'm sitting, uh, the Queen is, the Sheikh is here, and Prince Philip is here, and the Queen is over there where you're sitting. And um, I'm desperately trying to make polite conversation, which is just coming out like gobbledygook. And then I got my cup of tea, um, and the Queen and Prince Philip are having a very intense conversation about what's in the sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> what they eat. Very, very important very stuff. Very right? important conversation about what, what is this, Philip? What do you think it is? Is it fish paste? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and the milk is over here on the other side of uh, Prince Philip. And I want some milk in my tea. <laughs> but I I, my br brain goes completely dead. I cannot remember how I'm supposed to address fi Prince Philip. I mean, is it Sir? Is it Your Majesty? Is it Your Highness? Well, I, I, I cannot or remember. Phil. Or <laughs> Phil, yes. <laughs> or, here, you. Um, uh, and anyway, is it rude to ask him to pass the milk? You know, am I supposed to ask, look for a lackey? Excuse me, <laughs> could I have the milk, please? So I finished up not having any milk in my tea because <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't sort it out in my head. Oh, God, it, it was a lesson in embarrassment, really, the whole thing. But, but they were lovely. They were uh, utterly gracious, I have to say. Well, uh, <laughs> Chris, uh, I th I've been told that it's time to, to answer some of the questions that, that we have. Oh, great. What? These are for Helen? These are mine. So, well, I'm gonna. So I will ask Helen the question. Oh, okay. And, you can and I get to ask you, you yours. Ask oh, mine. and so we'll take turns. There okay. You go. you go one, so and then the I'll go one. one that's got, am I allowed to say the name of who who's asking the question? Linda H. Helen, I came all the way from Maryland for this. Wow. Hey. You are fantastic. If you could work with any celebrity, dead or alive, who would it be? Well, first of all, I wouldn't work with any celebrity any celebrity. I'd work with an actor, or I'd work with a director, but um, this whole world of celebrity that has sort of crept into our world, um, it, uh, you know, I, I, I reject that term. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but, um, um, but there are some wonderful actors I would love to work with, really, really wonderful actors. Um, uh, and, and there's quite a long list of them. Um, and, 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 uh, and many of them are women. Sadly, there are still, to this day, not enough uh, projects that have two great female roles, let alone one. <laughs> I, I like a film that's got five great female roles. So I'd love to work with Ruth Wilson, for example. I think she's a wonderful actress. I would have liked to have worked with Audrey Hepburn. Oh, yes. Oh, I can imagine. Yes, and, and a beautiful person, yeah. too. Yes. Okay, Hawk. Yeah. This is from Jenny H. Throughout your career, whenever you faced moments of fear or self-doubt, what got you through it? Any words of wisdom or inspirational thoughts? Mm. Good question, because I yes. have a story about that. Oh, you do? Yes. 
and you, I think you know it. Uh, I was the first movie that I was producing on day seven. Uh, we quit making the movie, and two weeks later, I was told by Warner Brothers that we were no longer making the film. Very devastating. The director fired the actor, and nobody wanted to replace the actor, and all of a sudden, everybody lost faith in the piece of material. And so I had to go tell the crew, my family, that they didn't have a job anymore, and I didn't have a job anymore on this Friday. And I told the crew, and then I went home, and I had a six-year-old and a three-year-old, and when I walked in and told my wife what had happened, she said, gee, that's too bad, and I want a divorce on the same day. Same day, true story. And for about a month or so, I was in a fetal position at a buddy's couch. Not, I'd lost my career and I'd lost my family. And uh, I got a phone call. Anybody here ever heard of Robert Evans? And <laughs> the kid stays in the picture and, and he was my mentor and he just passed away last week. And it just, he was, he was a courageous man. Any rate, uh, I got a phone call. If, if I'm sure you've probably heard the way Bob talked and I, I, I'm sitting on this couch and I answer the phone. He says, uh, hello, Howard. And I said, hi, Bob, uh, how'd you know it was me? <laughs> and I said, oh, I recognize your voice. Uh, I, he said, uh, how you doing? I said, oh, I'm not doing real well, Bob. Uh, how are you doing? He, uh, I'm not doing real well either. I said, oh, what's the problem? He said, oh, well, I'm uh, doing this movie, uh, Marathon Man. And I said, oh, yeah, how's it going? He said, oh, we've been shooting 10 days. I said, yeah, he said, we're 10 days behind. <laughs> and I said, well, well, what's the problem? He says, well, how the hell do I know? Why do you think I'm calling you? <laughs> so I said to Bob, uh, where are you shooting? And he paused and asked somebody in the room wherever he was. He said, uh, Mount Kisco. It's about an hour outside of New York City. And I said, well, is that where you are? Pause, pause. He said, well, uh, no, I'm at the Carlisle with a blonde. <laughs> that was Bob. <laughs> so I... It gave me something to do. I got on the plane, I read the script, got off the plane at 5.30 in the morning, car was there to meet me, to take me to the Ramada Inn in Mount Kisco, New York, and I thought to myself, okay, Bob's asked me to take over and find out what I can do. I'm gonna spend the whole day really observing and watching. And um, so I took a shower and I came out and got in the car with Academy Award winning director John Schlesinger, Midnight Cowboy, Darling, um, you name it and uh, Academy Award winning cinematographer Conrad Hall, Academy nominated production designer, and I was about to meet in a few hours Academy Award winning Dustin Hoffman. And so I get in the car and we go up to this place, it's a white house near the end of the movie, it's a white house on top of a hill, and there's a long driveway, and the first shot is a drive up. It's a drive up with, Helen, uh, with uh, uh, Martha Keller and Dustin. They're gonna drive up into a circular driveway in front of the White House, and they're gonna get out and play a short dialogue scene. So we get up to the top of this hill and we're looking down at the driveway and the house is over here to the left and John goes, Connie, how about a, maybe a 35? And we'll see the car and as, as we pan the car up the hill, the house will be a nice cutting piece. And Connie went, oh yeah, that's nice. He said, but what if we get 100 mil and we get a little bit tighter on the car and then when we pan over, the house will be a little bit out of focus and it'll make a better cut. And John went, oh, that's a good idea. He said, have we got a 400 mil? And Connie said, oh yeah, we do. He said, can we build a parallel on this hill over here? Let's look at a 400 mil over here. So we get up on this parallel. John starts to look and Dustin comes up below, he's just arrived, and he looks up, he says, John, I've gotta to talk to you. In a minute, Dustin, I'm picking a shot. He said, well, I've gotta to talk to you as soon as possible because I, the, the dialogue sucks. I can't do this scene today, right? Why are they 10 days behind? <laughs> so he says, I'll be with you. Go to makeup and hair, and I'll be with you in a minute. And John looks through the, the camera and says, eh, I don't know. He says, can we get the car up here? And the car comes up, and Connie and John and I get in the back of the car. We go all the way back down the driveway. He says, what if we're in a two-shot over them, and we see the house in the background? And Connie says, well, if we're going to do that, why don't we put a mount on the front of the car and just do a straight point of view? It's 9.30 in the morning. John, John says, I, I don't know. I, 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 I've got to go talk to Dustin. And off he goes into the trailer. No, we don't even have the drive up. 
So they're in there for a long time, and finally, who, this guy who's 29 years old is gonna is gonna actually walk into that trailer. I knocked on the door, and John answered the door and said yes. And I said I've got to talk to you. So I'm talking to Dustin. I said no, I've got to talk to you now. And I brought Connie Hall with me, and I went in and I said, John, you're the director. You have a chance. You you know what shot you want. That's the shot you want, and you tell all of us. I said, and Connie, being the DP, you have one chance to make a suggestion. And John, between his suggestion and what you originally wanted to do, we're gonna shoot it. And they both looked at me and said, whoa, this guy means business. And Dustin, at the end of the trailer, who was at the other end of the trailer, said, what does this have to do with me? And I said, Dustin, you have, and this is all the angst of losing my wife, my family, my, I said, you have every right to have a problem with the scene. And he smiled. I said, a week ahead of time, you have no right on the day of shooting to have a problem with the scene. I said, I will get William Goldman up here, the wonderful screenwriter who had written the screenplay, and we will go over tonight all the next week and we'll always stay a week ahead of time, but today you're going out and shooting the scene as written. We lost one day in the next 75 days of shooting and it changed my career. So the question about fear, I learned that day to have courage. Three Academy Award winners, I'm 29 years old, but I had the courage and I knew what I was talking about. And so I say to all of you, don't be afraid. Have courage of your thoughts, whatever you feel is right. Is with consideration and, te and integrity, don't just always, you know, well, I know this. We all, I'm still learning. But have courage. Don't be afraid. Oh, wonderful advice. <laughs> Helen, look, yes. anonymous. Ooh. Nothing to do with being in the White House. This is anonymous. <laughs> Any thoughts on reprising the Queen for... Uh, for m later seasons or the of the crown well i i was um no i i i've 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 passed the ermine on i think of it that way i've passed the crown on i you know there's always a danger in in any actor's career two dangers one is called success and the other is called failure <laughs> and they're both as dangerous as each other in many ways and um i stopped doing prime suspect um, and I was one who who put an end to it. I said no. I I that I I'm I, it's it, I've I'm doing the last one, and that's it. I'm not doing any more because I knew if I was knocked over by a bus the next day, the headline would be Jane Tennyson, you know, knocked over by a bus. And then the incredible success of the Queen, obviously, uh, you know, the ermine settled upon my shoulders. And I, I'm not the Queen, uh, you know, I'm an actress. And, and I, yes, I played the Queen with g great success and great pleasure. But, you know, I want to move on. So um, The Crown is an amazing series. I'm sure lots of you have watched it. It's it got fantastic actresses in it who are just doing brilliantly well. And no, I've, I've passed that, uh, I've passed the crown on, definitely. Yeah. Right. Okay, your turn. Yes. This is for either you or me, but uh, it's for you. Uh, <laughs> what project do you wish you'd produced? Um, well, looking at that incredible uh, number of b amazing films you've produced, I can't believe there are any that you haven't actually sort of fulfilled. Uh. Well, I wasn't around then, but I guess one of my favorite films of all time is Casablanca. Yeah. And I would have loved to have been part of that because not only was it a love story, but the politics involved in it were exactly where I'm at in my life. And of so course, not successful when it came no, out. No, not at all. Which no. is interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's amazing yeah. to think that now. Yeah. And is and that's that's the little light that, that we keep switching on we're in when we're in despair, isn't it? Well, well, Casablanca wasn't a success, you know. <laughs> and look at it now. So yeah. um, how about It's a Wonderful Life wasn't a success either? Yes, yes, I I mean, amazing. You know, yes. People, yes. things, audi movies have to find their audience, and sometimes they they don't. Yes. And yes. Uh, or they find it in a different medium. Yes, but the great thing about a movie is it's there. You can revisit it. Yeah. It's there, and 
And um, whereas with theatre, obviously, you know, you can talk about the great performances you've seen or, or, or the great productions you've appeared in, but only, only the people who saw it will ever remember it, you know. Right. And that's the great thing about a movie. It's also the terrible thing about a movie because sometimes four o'clock, you know, three o'clock in the morning, you're channel surfing, you know, like half asleep, <laughs> and then, oh my God, oh no, <laughs> what what possessed me to wear that outfit or to have that hair? It's <laughs> it can be uh, alarming. I had a wonderful experience, and I don't know if it happened in New York, but uh, they played Casablanca, and they took the music out, and there was a symphony orchestra that played the score. Live, yeah, and then you so you watched the movie and heard the score live. Oh, how oh my wonderful! God. It was marvelous, how wonderful, just fabulous, yeah, just fabulous. So, here's looking at you, kid, yeah. Um, you Helen, too. yes, what part of the acting process? Oh, this is from Rosie Glenn. Hi, Rosie, what part of the acting process do you see actors overlooking that should really be more finely tuned? I think, um. I think uh, I think the physicality, I, I, uh, maybe the physic. Uh, if we're talking about film, just to remember, as we t said earlier, as long as the shot allows you to do it, remember the importance of your physicality, of the way you're sitting, um, of what your hands are doing. Uh, you, you, you can you can tell so many stories with with very small uh, delicate things. Um, I, actually, it's very interesting watching Edward Norton up there, for example, and and there is an actor who you know every part of his body is working to tell the story of the character. Um, it, it's 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 in him from head to toe. So m m maybe that. Uh, um, also, um, hair and makeup. I've always said many a great performance has been destroyed by lip liner. <laughs> you know, um, in including my uh, my own occasionally. Um, uh, um, and and just be really careful about hair and makeup. Don't. Uh, I, you know, you must be in control of that and, and really say, no, that's too far or whatever. Right. Yeah. Well, so I've got an Edward Norton story. Oh, yeah. For all me. those oh, really? people yes. who uh, I was producing this movie, Primal Fear, and we were trying to get a major young actor to play opposite Richard Gere. <coughs> and everybody was passing. And a wonderful casting director, Deb Aquila, uh, was head of casting at Paramount. And she had gone all over the country, and especially in New York, she had seen 2,500 young boys. And she said that she had found a couple that she thought were good enough to test. So w we brought them out to California, and we were going to shoot on stage 10 with Richard Gere. And we were hoping that Sherry Lansing would go with an unknown in case at the moment Leo Di Leonardo DiCaprio would pass. And sure enough, that morning, just before we started to test, we heard from Sherry that Leo had passed. So are we ever going to really be able to make this movie with only one star? And I went into this trailer, and I introduced myself. And I said, hi, I'm, I'm uh, at that time, still Howard Koch. And he said, oh, oh hi, I'm, I'm Edward. And I said, where are you from, Edward? He said, uh, West Virginia. Now, the character is from West Virginia, OK? And I said, well, it's nice to meet you, and we look forward. And if you need anything, you can always come to me during the day, and I hope you enjoy yourself. Who, who, who's going to play the other c c character? I said, well, Richard Gere is going to Oh, wow. You know. So he comes on the stage, and we start to shoot. And we do the first couple of scenes. And he's good, you know. and he's a young guy. And then we do the scene, for those of you who have seen Primal Fear, where in the middle of the scene, he changes from Aaron, the sweet kid, to Roy, the killer. And when he did the test, all of us lost our breath. And when, the, when Greg Hoblet, our director, cut, Richard turned to all of us and went, and all of us went, oh, my God. And we showed the test to Sherry. 
and we thought well, it's it's a home run. And Sherry said, "No, I want another. I want him to do another test." And we had to go through it again with Edward. By the time we started shooting, that video of his test was all over the city. Mm -hmm. Every agent wanted to be his agent. Every actor wanted to work with Edward Norton, and it was he was. By the way, not from West Virginia. He didn't stutter. He was from from Maryland, uh, and he was a patrician kid who went to Yale Drama School. Yeah. But he he got all of us. Yeah. Deb, are you in the office? On it? <laughs> Deb, yeah. there she is. Yeah. Deb Ferentino, who's and and Sophie Hoblet, Greg's uh, Greg's daughter. Okay. So yeah, that was uh, that was quite a day, and I'm sure I don't. I don't know what, what happened. I think you were pregnant with Sophie, I think, at the time. Yeah. Now, yeah. Uh, my, my husband is here somewhere. Where are you, Tay? I know you've got a question for Hawk. Uh-oh. So I am, I'm uh -oh. going to call on my husband to ask his question. You know, I, I had the, uh, the, for the fortune to work with uh, then Hawk, uh, Howard Koch. I, I, yeah, I call him Hawk all the time. <laughs> Howard Koch Jr. and Gene Kirkwood, who was his partner at the time, their first film that they produced, I was, uh, they hired me to direct and attend the island. But so we've been friends for a long time, and to be able to have somebody like Hawk literally there, uh, giving me the floor, it was my film, but preparing it in such a way that I was, I did have every opportunity to, you know, he was after me to make sure I wouldn't uh, go long and go over. But unbelievable support. But anyway, one of the great things was always the stories that he told <laughs> from having been an AD. He was one of the great, great first ADs of the business. And very much in demand, and you know from the films that he worked on. A great story in Chinatown that Hawk told me. Uh, he had a very famous actress who became even more famous <laughs> after this, but was not easy. Forget about the dress, they getting her out of the dressing room. <laughs> getting her to the set. So, Hawk, I'd like you to talk about uh, your how you were able to get Faye to the <laughs> <laughs> Well, getting her to the set was not very easy. Uh, and I think part of being an AD and part of being a producer and part of being a director is being a, a psychologist. And having to, and by the way, I must say, I can't give take full credit for this book because my wife Molly Jordan Koch wrote it with me. And as I say in the book, in the acknowledgments, without Molly, who I did, by the way, ten months after I became Hawk, found her, met her. It's an amazing story in the book, and we've been together for 23 years. And <laughs> thank you, she's. Without Molly, there is no magic. So that's, that's what's important. But Faye, you have to be a psychologist. And I was always going into her trailer in the morning, and she was angry about this or that. I said, and I'd say, Faye, I'm trying to like you. I'm really trying to like you. But there was a scene that took place in a booth, a red, red leather booth. It's the morning after Jack, uh, Jake Giddis has had his nose cut. And um, it's a scene where it's a two shot of Jack with the, the bandage on his nose and Faye. And it's the first shot scene of the morning and we're ready to shoot. And I'm, here's the camera. It's a two shot, Faye's there, uh, uh, Jack's here. And I'm standing right behind Roman, who's a, a touch shorter than I am. And uh, just as I'm about to roll the camera, because that's what the AD does, one hair on Faye's head stuck up, and it almost looked like it was like a sword sticking in her blonde hair. And so Roman went, Faye, Faye, there's one hair. Can you just, and Faye looked and put the hair down like this. And I said, okay, everybody, and, and the hair popped up again. And Roman said, come on, Faye, can we get, and, and she went, Susie, Susie Germain, the hairdresser. Susie came in and psss, with the spray, and it went down. I said, okay, everybody, here we go, and it popped up again. <laughs> and Roman, who knows everything about everything, by the way, said, Faye, can, we, can somebody cut that? You're not cutting a hair on my head, Roman. I, 
Roman said, Faye, you have 475,000 follicles in your head. One hair isn't going to make a difference. You're not cutting a hair of my head. Okay, Susie comes back in, sprays it again. Finally, it stays down. And finally, I roll the camera. We hit the slate and dialogue, dialogue. Ooh, it gives me a chance to stand up. <laughs> and Faye is talking to Roman, uh, to uh, Jack. And after about two lines, the hair pops up. <laughs> so Roman doesn't say anything. Faye's looking at Jack, and Roman walks in. Now the camera can see him. And he goes, boom! You've never heard swearing like that sailor. And she left, she went into the trailer, and again, how to learn how to become a producer. I called, I was the AD, I called Bob. Bob, this is what happened. And Bob said, uh, take care of it. <laughs> and finally, I was able to get Faye and Roman Roman to apologize, but blah, blah, blah. And if you ever see the film, our great costume designer, Anthea Silbert, put a hat on her head for the scene. So when you see the scene, the hat's on her head. Thank you. Is Taylor, is that the story you wanted? <laughs> oh. Um, or, or when she wouldn't flush her toilet in the, she had the Teamster, nine Teamsters we went through because she, you know, you press the thing in. Oh, yes. Well, they are complicated. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I'm on Faye's side. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I told her. Very quickly, Faye would just, in the back of a station wagon, the teamster, Bobby, would pick her up. Or, or whatever his name comes, Jerry would pick, him up, pick her up. And, uh, and she'd just crawl into the back of the station wagon. There was a mattress there for her. And she'd sleep until she got to the... So to makeup and hair. And one day, Bobby, I'm, I'm sorry, Jerry, her regular teamster, got sick. And so Bobby, who was our assistant transportation captain, who, who, who had a, a stutter, he, he did, that's just what he had, went to pick her up. And she wouldn't come out of her house because she believed that, where's Jerry? I'm not coming out. Oh, and yeah. poor B -B -B Bobby was absolutely scared. And I had to literally call Faye and say, yes, you're driver is sick, get in the car with Bobby. She was easy. She was really easy. I have to say, uh, great to hear these great stories. What's really impressing me, Hawk, is that you remember everybody's name. That's pretty cool. You know, that's amazing. And obviously one of the reasons you are the great producer that you are. I know when my husband, for example, walks on the set, he knows everybody's name. Yes. And, and well, you we're obviously, a How do you, we're a family. You, you yes. know you're you know, we're a family. Every, yes. You know everybody in the family, right? And uh, my father was that way, and I think that's what I learned from. He knew he'd get on the set, and, uh, and, and you know, he knew the craft service guys. How's your son? How's he doing? Yeah. I mean, how's your son, <coughs> Bill? How's he doing? Not just how's your son. Yeah, that's, a, that's very, very impressive. What does that say? Oh, it says time, time is up. Time is up. Oh. oh. Okay, well. Oh, sorry, we didn't get through all of your questions. Can I just say... This was the most fun hour and a half was I've had fun? in it so long too, with Hulk. you. I, I right. thank you. I thank you. It was lovely. So much. Yeah. You know, this wouldn't have happened. I asked Helen if she would do this with me because nobody wanted to come and just listen to me, and I knew everybody <laughs> came to listen to Helen. And the fact that she went ahead and did this is the reason we're all here tonight. So no, thank you. No, no, Hulk. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.